uh, to our first series of panels uh, of the fifth Platypus Affiliated Society Convention. Uh, I will be moderating uh, today's event. Uh, this is the first of our series of what are being called perspectives, where we introduce um, parties, tendencies, uh, sometimes even journal projects on the left. Uh, this will carry on until tomorrow, correct? Uh, here on, in this first session we have A.J. Signuri of the Green Party uh, USA. And I'm not going to give a long introduction other than to say that we we published an interview uh, with the presidential candidate of the Green Party, Jill Stein, uh, in issue 51. And uh, hopefully today we'll carry forward that dialogue. Um, so I'm going to allow uh, Mr. Signori to introduce the Green Party, what its what its strategy is going forward after the 2012 election, uh, how it sees itself uh, evolving politically in this country, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, I won't really be uh, saying anything uh, so long as you guys formulate good questions, so get your pins out. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Signori, the Green Party. Well, I thank um, everyone for allowing me to be on this panel and everything. Um, I am the co-chair for the Green Party of the United States, one of, one of the co-chairs, and I'm also the vice chair here for the Illinois Green Party as well. The Green Party got started around the 70s, during a time when Germany, in Germany, during a time where there was nuclear problems, environmental problems going on in Europe and everything. And it was then where a lot of environmentalists and activists got together and formed a coalition, creating this Green Revolution. And because of that, they formed the Green Party, which started in Germany, as I said, and then throughout Europe, it just started to grow and everything. It wasn't until 1984, there was a meeting in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, where it was then the Associated States of the Green Party got started, and that's where we got our bylaws, and we created an organization there. Since that time in 84, we are now a political party, followed by the Federal Elections Commission, known as the Green Party of the United States. Um, our purpose is we are a political party, so we run candidates on every level, local, state, and national. Um, because of that, we have elected nearly 200 Greens in the United States. The most prevalent would be California. Right behind California would be Wisconsin. And here in Illinois, we have close to 10 elected officials as well, most of them here in the Chicago area. And so, not only just a political party, we're also an activist organization. We work with a lot of activists on the left, that be it with the environmentalists, that be it with Occupy, that be it with other radical organizations as well, just to be out front. And that's what the Green Party is. We are mostly out front on the issues when it comes to social justice, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to women's issues. We're pretty much the only party that is out front on those things. And a good example of that in Washington, D.C., if you guys mostly are aware, with the Excel protests that happened, most of the Greens went out that way. We had a delegation from Illinois went to D.C., we had a delegation in Maine, delegation for D.C. statehood, and Jill Stein was there as well, being on that forefront. And so our strategy is pretty much, you know, electing candidates, because we're in that business of being a political party, but we're also in the business of networking with other organizations in order to advance the issues and to pretty much say, you know, we're being shut out by corporate media, we're being shut out by state election laws. Um, as I was talking to someone earlier, Illinois is one of the top five worst states to gain ballot access in Illinois. Uh, it, even to run a gubernatorial candidate in Illinois, you need 25,000 plus signatures just to be on the ballot which means you actually need 40,000 signatures just to, for insurance purposes, so if you get rid of um, objections from line-by-line -line items, then um, that's the only way to do it. So because of that, you know, that's why the Green Party is not as prevalent 
in Illinois, in the United States, because there's a lot of barriers that are put up in place just so the two-party system can do what they need to do. So year in, year out, all you see is Republican and Democrats. We have to spend all of our time and resources in order just to get media attention, just to be on the ballot. And so year in, year out, we always have to create a strategy in order to overcome those obstacles. Um, so at that point, I'm just going to leave it at that. Do you have any questions or? Okay. Um, I'll take questions from the floor. No questions. Well, I'll start off. Um, just thinking about some of the things that that Jill said. Um, you know, she she pointed uh, in two different respects to American labor. Uh, on the one hand, she said um, the Chicago teacher strike over the summer broke with the tradition of organized labor in this country. They had the courage to fight back against the Democratic administration and against the very person who was Barack Obama's right-hand man in the city where the administration's oppressive educational policies originated. And then pointing historically, and I think that this really raises some issues about the Green Party's relationship to, to organized labor and its ambitions there. She said, look at the labor movement. When did the labor movement make progress? When there was a real movement out in the streets, as in the early 1900s, alongside independent political parties, the Debsian Socialists, the La Follette uh, Progressives, the Farmer and Labor Party, etc., that could put the labor movement's demands into the political discourse and drive it forward. Mm -hmm. So now when you know, historically organized labor was, was really the beating heart of progressive politics in the United States and it's in severe decline, uh, how do you think about the Green Party in relation to existing uh, political organizations such as worker self-organizations? Well, it, with that in mind with the unions, uh, I do agree with that to a point, and this is what that is. The unions is a great concept. As everyone knows historically, unions, they needed to have fair wages. They were in unfavorable conditions in order to perform what they need to do for work. So they had to form something, that be it now a union, in order to voice their concerns of, we need fair wages, we need good working conditions, just in order to have a standard of living so they can have a family, so they can do well in advance within their job. And that was very prevalent here in Chicago, up in Milwaukee, Detroit, all right here, what's, what's now what some people call the socialist belt, because where most of the unions got formed was around the Midwest. So from there, when you have all those people who were starting the unions and over time got into more administrative positions in the unions, they started creating their own bully pulpit, trying to gain their own political muscle, which is fine, but now they have to lean to an, one political party, and that political party is the Democratic Party. And so with the teachers' union and labor unions, year in, year out, they always endorsed Democratic campaigns. And so the question to them that we're posing is, you know, what have they done for you? Pat Quinn, is not in favor, is pretty much doing Scott Walker style of collective bargaining bills right now. That's what's heard in labor unions. We have a school system in Chicago that is not helping the teacher unions whatsoever, which caused a strike to begin with. But year in, year out, they will elect, or excuse me, endorse the Democratic candidate, one of which is the current president who nominated and got in his Secretary of Education, who was a former CEO of CPS, Arnie Duncan. Race to the top, and how's that working out? Schools in the South Side are closing, schools in the West Side are closing. So, with labor unions, we want to, we want to help labor unions, but they have to get out of the practice, or saying, you know, there's more than just Democrats. You know, every year we go to these questionnaire, these endorsement meetings. They ask a series of questions of what we do in terms of our platform, what we do as candidates and everything. We go to the meetings and we don't even get a consideration. 
now every now and then Jeremy Carpenter ran in 2010 as well as 2008 he's gotten some endorsements from Ask Me in other places that that's here and there but I'm talking about statewide and nationally so when we talk to labor unions you know it's, it's pretty much a frank conversation what are you guys doing we want to help labor unions we're in favor of unions but you know you can't go into the party that is pretty much eliminating the things that you guys want to do you know so with the green party we know historically what the unions are about and we want to go back to those um, Eugene Deb style of unions and everything that's where I that's where I believe in um, I grew up as a radical um, since since college and everything so me being the Green Party you know these are the kind of issues that I raise within the Green Party is that you know we have to talk about these things um, if not then what are we doing in the business of politics so um, I'm just gonna leave it at that after that answers your question unless there's something want to stand on that looks like we've got some some questions here um, going off what you just mentioned about I guess the unions as seeing only the Democrats okay. take as a possibility. Um, what role do you see the Green Party in playing as, I mean, to function as a third party? And that you, I think you mentioned there's like kind of the, it seems that the characteristics of politics is just Democrats or Republicans. So, really, what does that mean? Right. Um, do you see that the Green Party can somehow play a qualitative role in changing the nature of politics? Like in a more parliamentary fashion? I'm just guessing, I'm just putting a word to it. And, um, or do you, I mean, do you think these type of politics that maybe the Green Party is trying to introduce, do they exist anywhere in the world right now? Like, if you think of an example, uh, just like the function of the Green Party and, and how it's yeah. out there and everything. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things I tell people when I have interviews or do stuff like this about the Green Party is if, you, if I say, if you go to London, I've done this before, I've traveled. Europe and elsewhere. If you go to places like London or Paris and ask someone, Democratic Party, Republican Party, they don't know what that means. But if I say Green Party in Oakland, California, or Green Party in Auckland, New Zealand, they know what that means. Because Green Party is essentially a universal political party around the world. We have, in fact, a year ago we did our big international congress in Senegal, Africa, talking about international issues. So we have representatives of the United States going to that. We even have America's um, symposium that we do just here in the Americas. So the Green Party is a universal party, so our 10 key values is a universal thing. And the, everything we talk about when it comes to issues, we talk about that internationally. We have Greens elected in Japan and Australia. France, the United Kingdom, Germany. So all those issues they talk over here, we talk about those issues here too, and we try to be out in the forefront with those as well. Um, the Green Party also tries to provide um, the qualitative information because we actually talk to people, to listen to their narratives on what's going on, and then trying to see how we can put that into practical politics. So the Green Party is a people's party because we started out in the streets and we still are in the streets and then trying to go from an activism, community and organizing role into a political role and seeing if we can put both feet in those arenas or trying to be in one realm, say in politics, and then radiate outwards in order to create effective change at the local, state, and national level. Does that answer your question? I'm sure that we'll just build the conversation okay. so come right around if people still want to ask questions about it. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why the Green Party and why the 1970s, because presumably some of the issues that the Green Party uh, has been at the forefront of politicizing, like environmental degradation, you know, have been around at least since the time of Eugene Debs, if not far earlier, um, and certainly you know, the need for a kind of um, progressive uh, party in, in electoral politics has been around for a long time. 
So what happened, uh, especially on the left in the 1970s, that made the Green Party a universal party throughout the world by, by the 80s and 90s? How do you see the left uh, changing uh, in ways at that time that sort of um, <laughs> so um, bear with me and hopefully I can really Again, they're blocking my voice on this. <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting you ask that question. Um, a week ago, I was down at Indiana State University um, talking to high school students about the role of the LGBT community and how we grew. All right? And it's the exact same thing with the Green Party. Why the 70s and why I'm picking on the 70s is because a lot of things happened in the 70s, just like any political party. If you look at the Progressive Party and other parties in the 1800s, all of them formed by things happening. The so like the Republican Party is a great example. The Republican Party created over time. You know, it's just that they picked a person, and re remember, the Republican Party was a third party at the time. They picked a candidate who won, <laughs> who won the presidency and put the Republican Party out there, all right? And now they're strong today. So just like the Green Party, it all built it up. There was people in the counterculture movement, the movement in the 60s just got fed up and they needed to have some sort of social movement. And that social movement was the Green Revolution. Now that doesn't mean that happened in the 60s, it did. It also happened in the 50s and prior to. It's just that the 1970s just became a lot of these social movements that started happening. The feminist movement, the second wave feminist movement started. Stonewall, I mean the gay movement, the LGBT community over time over time, but it took Stonewall, the riot at Stonewall, to say we need to advance these issues. So same way with the Green Revolution. So that's why it was the 70s, I feel, was that building up, building up, and then all of a sudden it exploded. People want to do something. So it's creating a Green Revolution and started a political party, because that's how they felt. They felt the political arena has to be that arena in order to advance the issues and everything while activists are out on the streets. I can just tie these questions together a little bit uh, with your comments. Um, it seems to me that when people talk about third party politics in the U.S., they're torn between, you know, an argument for Europeanization of American right. electoral politics, we need proportional representation, right. we need a very different system, and looking to something like the Republican Party, uh, where in, in the 19th century, where the emergence of a third party into in international political life qualitatively transformed the nature of politics as a whole. Uh, it, it seems to me that in some ways the latter is, you know, marks a much more ambitious vision in terms of what would it mean to operate in parliamentary politics in such a way as to radically transform the nature of our political environment, uh, rather than in a sense of a more conservative gesture of, you know, we need to get rid of the two-party system, we need to get rid, I mean, in some ways the U.S provides a more revolutionary situation, uh, electoral, uh, with the winner-take-all presidential uh, electoral system. And so I'm, I'm wondering how you think about that in terms of like the tensions between kind of social movement and actually you know taking political through through the electoral system. Well, you kind of nail on the head of the Lord later on in that comment, and that is. The system that we have now, the culture that we have now in the United States is different in Europe and Latin America and elsewhere because we are in a culture that whatever happens, whether it be government or any social institution, puts the people in a corner and as 
I grew up in the in rural Illinois, so like if you corner a dog, the dog will bite back at some point. And that's what the people do in the United States. Look at the teachers union that just happened. You put teachers in a corner. We had a strike here in Chicago. When the whole summer about Republicans talking about reproductive rights and everything, they put the women in a corner, they had to fight back. And that fight back was getting rid of certain legislators and everything. So that's the kind of culture we have now. So it's really reactionary versus Latin America and Europe where everyone talks and trying to get something done. And there's this universal approach by saying, you know, we can have a Green Party, we can have a Communist Party, a Socialist Party. In the United States, we don't have that. And I didn't mention it going to the question you had. It's already, it's already conditioned in the United States that there's two, there's two levels. The first level is the two parties. And that bottom level is the big three parties. The big three parties being Green Party, Libertarian Party, and the Constitution Party. All right? um, the Socialist Party, for the longest time, had a hand in politics to the point that Milwaukee had a socialist mayor for a long time. It was a socialist city, and it's very effective to this day. So with the Green Party, I mean, that's the kind of, that's what we're up against in terms of a political culture is that we have to pretty much break down this two-party system, this two-party mentality in order for Democrats and Republicans, Greens, Libertarians, Socialists can all be on a ballot and all serve in all forms of government. Um, I can't remember her um, first name, but um, Sirwan, who ran in Seattle, was a Socialist candidate. 20,000 signatures. It was 20,000 signatures, if I remember right. Um, it was 20,000 signatures. That was the highest any third party, in, let alone a socialist candidate, ever got in Seattle. And Seattle's pretty liberal. So um, so that's a very significant event. And I think we're going to see more of that um, with Jill only getting 0.3% um, in this presidential election. That's actually a, a huge leap. If you look at the prior elections, David Cobb didn't do that well. Cynthia McKinney in two, that was 2004. Cynthia McKinney in 2008 didn't do that well. So Jill actually put the Green Party ahead a little bit that, you know, there is something there. People are paying attention. People do want change. And so that's why a lot of people voted for Jill at that time. And that's why all of us had that got on the ballot um, in 36 states in 2012. So people want to change. So we're actually moving towards that direction. Now we have to you know, again, get conditioned of, you know, having the media expose us a little bit more, having people endorse us a little bit more, as well as getting into organizations and doing things like this, you know, where people can come to a setting like this, having a conversation, to talk about what the Green Party is, and, you know, have these frank conversations and everything. And we are the only party that's on the left, because if you look at the Democrats, they're a little more center, if not the right. So, I mean, we're the ones who actually have to make, you know, Democrats look bad because, you know, we're the ones talking about the real issues. We're, that's why we're out front and everything. Here and then in the, the Randy. Uh, I think some of the discussion is beginning to get at different historical differences because the Republican Party emerged in a situation where the crisis of slavery was in existence and the two parties weren't dealing with it and it was a different kind of thing, and it was a real fight for political power. Right. At other times, there have been, you know, third parties come up and fade away and are much more minor. It seems like today, with the economic crisis, that there's the potential and the possibility of another upsurge that would be different than what went on in the 70s and, and that. And one of the things that is happening is, you know, I think it was not only Occupy, uh, but another party that was formed, the Justice Party, which I work for, um, also came out of this new environment. And there's a lot more, there are other left parties, some of them socialist parties, running candidates. And the fact that this woman in Seattle got 29% of the vote as a socialist, 
is an indication that uh, the environment is really changing. And I think a lot of people dismiss third parties and they always get co-opted once they get in office, but they don't recognize the historical circumstances. Like you couldn't co-opt the Republicans fighting against slavery. You know, they did after the Civil War, but leading up to the Civil War, that wasn't the environment, that wasn't possible. And it seems to me today, with the economic crisis that's not going to go away, that there's third parties emerging, there's a discussion of fighting for political power, not just kind of, you know, the European social democratic model. And uh, one of the things I think is important to consider, uh, especially in relation to the Green Party, is working with other parties. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there were some discussions between the Justice Party candidate, Rocky Anderson, and Jill Stein. Um, but going forward, uh, I guess my question is, you know, how do you see working with especially the Justice Party, but also other parties? And the Socialist Alternative is running uh, the women again in Seattle, somebody in Minneapolis, somebody in Boston, uh, you know. In, in two years, the Justice Party will be running a, a fair number of con, uh, candidates. So uh, how do you see that coming together? Yes. That's my main objective um, and the reason why my, my personal platform I'm running for co-chair for the National Party is that we need to do more, if not better, outreach and networking. This is not our fight, it's everybody's fight. And anybody told the lady who was here in Chicago at the ASME Union Hall, she was talking about ballot, she was talking about get on the ballot. And I told him, like, how are you going to do that when you have states like Illinois, Oklahoma, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia are the five worst states to get ballot access? How are you going to do that? You know, yeah, you can do it in Montana. Yeah, you can do it in Idaho. You can probably maybe do it in Maine. But what resources do you have? What money do you have? Well, we have that because we actually have general counsel. We actually have resources. We know we talk to the people. And outside the Green Party, I'm the executive director for the Foundation Night Front, and that's what we do. We bring organizations together and talk about, hey, they have resources that you don't have. Talk to them. That's what I feel the Green Party needs to be doing. Talk to the Justice Party, Socialist Party, um, and anyone else to do things because this is not just our fight. It's everybody's fight when it comes to the left and third parties because there's some things that Justice Party maybe having that we don't have, you know. Um, same with the Socialist Party. I know some very effective socialists here in the United States, and I lean to them a lot, saying, I'm like, what do we do? I mean, can you get us inroads and everything? So I, I feel networking is a priority um, for the Green Party, and I'm, we're, I'm having personal conversations with those people, and some of my colleagues are doing the same. Um, now I just the executive, excuse, excuse me, the steering committee, but other representatives of the Green Party at the national and state levels. And, you know, I always, always welcome conversation. To the gentleman. Yeah, yeah. Randy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about the environment for a minute. It seems to be lacking from the discussion. In other words, like, you probably heard that the bee population, you know, is collapsing, you know, it's, it's uh, pollinates one third of the food in the United States. Right. And then uh, also in the news, I guess, is the rate of uh, melting of the ice in the Andes. You know, another, as if we need another, you know, proof of global warming, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, looking at the immensity, you know, the urgency, and those are just two of, you know, millions, you know, this ecological collapse, you know, facing all over the world. You know, so like looking at fossil fuels alone, does it look like the system is turning that around? Does it look like companies, you know, who compete against each other all around the world are going to stop fracking, you know, looking for oil and all that? In other words, you know, and so how anything short of revolution, you know, where you actually see state power, right? You know, governments are things that enforce economies, right? How do you plan, in other words, in other words, it seems like what's, what we've been talking about is just completely out of sync with the actual problem, right? You know, how do you solve this problem of planning, you know, on a world scale, right? 
to save the environment. Right, right. This is my basic question. It, it kind of goes back to a little bit of what I just said. Um, it's networking, networking with not just third parties, but even organizations. In Illinois alone, look at Illinois, you know, a lot of us are, are involved with the fracking movement here. Um, we have some people, a part of SAFE, um, for those of you who don't know who SAFE is, they're the Southern Illinois, um, what we call fractivists down there, who actually want a moratorium on fracking. And more specifically, the why they want a moratorium is not only just because of fracking alone, but Southern Illinois is in between two bookends of earthquake faults. One is the New Mandarin Fault, which is the one in 18, I think it's 1814. That earthquake happened, actually pushed the Mississippi River backwards, back to where its origins. The other one is the Wabash Fault, the Wabash Valley Fault, which they actually have had companies actually drilling for fracking and causing earthquakes. And seismologists are saying it's that fault line that's overdue for a bigger earthquake, like a 8.0 Richter scale type thing. So going back to the question, you know, we're working with organizations like that, and we'll, we go as far as you know working with the Occupy movement, go as far as working with um, elected officials who are doing city things as well as state representatives to say, you know, we need to do these things. We're going down to Springfield and testifying on why we need a moratorium. Our chair, Rich Whitney, who ran for governor, has been going down to Springfield and testifying. In fact, I think he's down there this week. So we're doing all those things. Um, since we don't have the power, like at the county level in Illinois or at state level in Illinois, you know, we actually have to put pressure on those who are in office and saying, look, we need a radical change. If we don't do that, then what's going to happen in Illinois when it comes to fracking, when it comes to lack of open preservation in Illinois? Going to the B issue, it's, it actually is beyond the B issue. Mons the, the Monsanto bill got passed, which was just snuck in. And the Monsanto bill essentially said that Obama signed saying uh, Monsanto can do it once with its GMO products. So while everyone was looking at the gay marriage bills, which is important, the Monsanto bill just got in the back door, which was a Republican who did that, put it, that bill in the back door for Obama to sign that bill. So we have that up against us. So we actually need a radical green revolution by go as far as standing in front of a bulldozer go as far as what we just did in D.C., you know, to saying, you know, enough's enough. We don't need a Keystone XL pipeline in the United States. Um, don't do anything with Anwar up in Alaska. Um, even go as far as saying, you know, stop wolf poaching in the West and stop killing bees and the bees are dying because we have too many pollutants in the air, um, GMO crops that are killing bees because the things that are actually trying to get their main objective is killing them. So we're on the forefront on that issue by working with other organizations and putting pressure on elected officials and reminding people, saying, you know, these are the same people that you elect in the office, please get us in office because we actually have a platform and we have a network in order to make real radical change in the state of Illinois and in the United States. I have a question back here. Yeah, I just want to bring it back to the theme of the convention, which is a utopian program. I was wondering uh, what role you see for the Green Party in advancing anti-capitalist or socialist consciousness, and what your program is, and how that relates to advancing such a utopian vision. One of the things um, we talk about a lot is cooperatives. All right, so, and we feel that the cooperative movement is a good alternative solution to the economic crisis that we have. And why is that? Um, capitalism, as we know, does not work. Laws of fair capitalism does not work. So we actually need to go back to something. Putting cooperatives on the side, one of the things that we have talked about in the 2010 election and 20, 2008 election 
is trying to have public banks in the United States. And public banking, you guys, some of you may not know, is essentially it's a centralized bank where all the money goes into that bank in that state. And of course, a very small percentage goes to the Federal Reserve, and even though we want, we don't want no Federal Reserve. So all that money stays in the state, and that state only profits. There's only one state in the union that does this today, and that's North Dakota. You guys might laugh because North Dakota, but they're the only state, when the bailout happened, they never asked for a bailout at all. They're so profitable that people are moving to North Dakota in order to have a standard of living and everything. So there's programs like that that we like to implement in the United States and the cooperatives work over the years. If you go to Spain with Mondragon, that's a very effective program that they have there. Um, there's a lot of cooperatives in the United States that work as well. Um, will it be World um, Electric? cooperatives, or even cooperatives that I opened up in Milwaukee, which was a bar, a drinking bar cooperative, you know, where you pay you 20-year membership, you get to vote for board directors with a membership discount by you discount or drink. Those work, you know. We profit, well, oh, excuse me, we profit um, gross 30, 30 a week, net 25. So it works. People like it. You know, now it's Milwaukee, yes, but no one thought it was going to work whatsoever. The first bar cooperative opened in Austin, Texas. We were the second one in the entire country. So it works. So even us Greens are not in the Latino office. We're doing things like that to show people these things work. A bookstore cooperative, um, food cooperative, bar cooperative. We need these kinds of things where workers are part of this participatory, unilateral model instead of this hierarchical model that we have where everything comes from top down and the workers are still getting not, pair, no, excuse me, not getting a fair wage. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. So I mean, as close to utopia as we can get to and everything in terms of programs, um, I think the cooperative movement is part of that program, you know, trying to reach towards that kind of Marxian type of economy where the workers participate and actually get in their fair wage. Um, and I think that's how it goes with utopia. And I like to remind some, some people is that utopia, I feel, is like self-actualization. But once you reach that, you have to keep reaching it. You're always reaching for utopia. You know, utopia is not always the end result. You always have to keep reaching for utopia. It's a great thing. Um, it's a great carrot. But sometimes that carrot can be a little bit further, a little bit further. So. I'll end up with that. Ed and then Greg and then Ed. I guess I maybe we'll take we'll, maybe we'll take these together and so have a bit more of a conversation and respond to each other as well. I, I want to bring the conversation back a little bit to how the Green Party fits in to the wider ecology of the left. I, I don't want to give too much of a preamble here, but you know, it seems like there are some people who come out of the anti-revisionist uh, movement, like our, our comrade from the RCP, and Lenny. Um, and you know, I think this speaks to a moment in the '70s, especially uh, when the goal seemed to be to seize political power on a national or even global level. And it seems that at the same time, the exhaustion or the implausibility of this project to some made more attractive uh, the kind of social movement approach and a kind of smaller scale strategizing like local or national cooperatives of the kind you mentioned and I think the Green Party often fits within here. But I guess you know if you take those two extremes, um, what actually interests me most are those on the left who uh, basically have a similar goal in mind uh, to the sort of uh, revolutionaries you might say, the, the sort of more hardcore revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. Um, but nonetheless intersect the Green Party or work within the Green Party in order to achieve their goals. I mean, for example, when I uh, attended a Green Party event a few months ago, uh, I met someone from, uh, I met a Marxist humanist involved in News and Letters, I met an anarchist, I met, um, I probably met a Trotskyist at some point, I met a former Hojaist, um, you know, coming out of the uh, anti-revisionist movement. So it seems like there's this whole collection uh, of people on the left uh, who are intersecting the Green Party. And I guess my question then is, uh, could you actually, you know, to the extent of your knowledge, like tell us a little bit about 
how different quarters of the left have worked with the Green Party at different points, because I know mm -hmm. um, the ISO has been a big presence, mm -hmm. I know other non-ISO socialists have been a big presence, mm -hmm. um, I know that the uh, vice presidential candidate Sherry Honkala was involved and is still involved with the League of Revolutionaries for New America, which comes out of the anti-revisionist movement. Right. So give us a sense of the fabric of the left mm. um, within the Green Party, and how has this changed over time also? If you want to take notes, because there's going to be a lot here. Understand. Uh, Greg? I like that, though. My, my question, actually, I, I don't want to distract from, 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 from that question, uh, but, but you mentioned workers' cooperatives and, and, and workers' control. And I wonder whether or not you see any, any possible contradiction between uh, the interests on the one hand in um, stopping the kind of uh, environmental degradation uh, that we see in contemporary capitalism and the interests of, of workers uh, to achieve great democracy over, over their form of work. But there doesn't seem to necessarily be an identity of interest there. Um, just as capitalists cut corners in order to uh, uh, make a profit, so there might be interest in workers in making choices that benefit them at the expense of, of, of you know, the environment, whether um, it's term, but just in terms of pollution, carbon emissions, or, or whatever. So it doesn't really seem as, as though there's a, a, a very easy way to reconcile those if, if you're looking at um, making changes on a very local level. Workers in a specific plan achieving um, their own cooperative. If, if you don't solve the problem of, of actually uh, changing the way society as a whole relates to each other. Right, right. Okay. Okay. My uh, question relates sort of to Ed's. Uh, during your presentation, you mentioned that uh, the Green Party tried to see if it could build both in the political and activist sphere, mm -hmm. as if they were two separate things. And I guess my question is, what is like, how are they different? What is the role that activism plays that perhaps can't be played by politics? Because I can imagine that some people might say, oh, well, activism just fulfills something that politics could, but right. at its point doesn't right now. So I'll just end it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take that in the order you would I'm going to start with you first. The cooperative movement, one of the things in the cooperative movement is one of their principles is to be socially conscious, okay? And they really respect, and they also respect the environment, okay? And the ways they do that, I'm gonna take food co-ops for, for a moment. They do a lot of fair trade with their products, whether it be fair trade coffee, fair trade food, things like that. They go to companies that help people in Latin America who are working on a coffee farm but they're getting paid better so they can have that livable wage that they want for their families or for themselves. And then in turn, they try to do something that like putting stuff back into the environment. They're not a co-op, but Lakefront Brewery in Wisconsin. What they do at the end of the day with all their grain for their beer, they take that all back to a farm. And all their cows, the same farm that they use, their cows, gets fed that way. So they actually recompose, they actually recycle all their food and everything. So co-ops can help the environment in that kind of sense by going, referring back to what the Green Party does, um, ecological wisdom and having social justice, um, being decentralized, um, but more importantly, future focus, all right? So that's the nice, tie between the cooperative movement and the Green Party is that they're both future focused. So when we talk about things like pollution, we're talking about things like the Monsanto Bill, how can we make radical environmental justice change by having whether it be a co-op or putting a cap on carbon or what or what have you. So those are things we have to think about that we always ask the question, how are we being future focused about this? And then how does this play out with our 10 key values as well? We always ask that question, just like the cooperative movement always asks the question, are we doing the very thing that our principles um, are at? I'm gonna go to over here with the activism politics. I've had this conversation with Bill Ayers because Bill and I see things differently with this. He feels that you know it's either activism or politics. It can't be both. Sometimes 
I am of the opinion that you can have a foot in activism and a foot in politics. And I've always been of the opinion that, you know, an activist can get elected into office and then start radiating their change from the inside out. But now I'm more of the opinion that you can be the activist and the politician by you can be saying, you on the floor saying, I want this bill being passed. They're saying no, I'm like, okay, then I'm out the door. Talking to my Occupy friends, I'm like, okay, this is what we need to do, all right? So-and-so's not doing this. We need to create a campaign. We need to organize and everything. So I feel you can be in activism and in politics at the same time. Because let's be honest, if you're an activist or a community organizer, you're also in the business of politics because you're going to elected officials. You're trying to create legislation, whether you're drafting legislation on your own, you're testifying. A good friend of mine, Wes King, in the Illinois Stewardship Alliance, he actually drafted a bill to promote more to promote um, credit for small farmers in Illinois, so that way they can produce quality food in Illinois, and that people in Illinois can go to small farmers rather than big corporate farms that lean towards more Monsanto and everything. So to end with that question, um, you can be an activist and be in politics at the same time, it's just a matter of how you go about doing it. That, that's a huge question. <laughs> With the left, um, when I introduce myself to people and they ask me what my, what my, poly, my philosophy is, um, I tell them I'm a Marxist and anarchist. Um, more of a situationist than anything else. Um, so Guy, um, Guy Brown is one of my favorites. Um, Pro Hone is also one of my favorites as well, but Karl Marx is right up there. Um, we try to have conversations with all kinds of people on the left. And my personal research the last four years is what is wrong with the left. And I've been talking to a lot of people from Bill Ayers or Churchill, different academics and academic scholars, talking to friends, talking to a lot of collectives, saying what is wrong. 1950s. A guy named William Buckley brought fiscal conservatives, religious conservatives, social conservatives, brought them all together in one table, saying, we're broken. What do we need to do? So from the 50s to the 80s, they got Republicans elected from school board to the presidency in the 80s, and yeah, just the 80s with Ronald Reagan and George, the first George Bush. Um, that's William Buckley. He did that. And I always talk to people in the Green Party and socialists and anarchists. I'm like, you know, how come we can't do that? How come we can't come together as the left and do these very things? And anarchists will say, well, I don't want to be in the business of politics. That's fine. But you can do things that we can't do. You know, you can go out and do rallies, you can do protests, or talk to people you know. So it goes, again, goes back to that networking thing. So to answer that question of what the Green's doing, we're still having conversations. You know, all of us are still in our own little left pocket, if you will. You know, I'm still talking to all my Marxist friends. I'm still involved with all my anarchist um, activities and everything. I still do that, but at the same token, you know, I, I remind them, okay, remember, there's the Green Party. This is what the Green Party does and everything. You know, it's so like an Occupy, I'm an occupier. When I say an Occupy means, I'm, that's, I'm just that, I'm an occupier, because it's an apolitical organization. I don't promote the Green Party because that's not my business, because I'm an activist. But when I'm in the Green Party, as co-chair, I remind them saying, we need to talk to Occupy. They can do things. You know, talk to Occupy, Occupy Wall Street, talk to Occupy Florida or whatever. Um, so we're having those conversations. But same token, we're, we're, I'm, we're trying to figure out how to pull everybody back together because the left needs, needs that. Just to repeat one part of the question, if I may, okay. um, I has, this, has this changed over time in terms of the composition of the left groups that are intersecting the Green Party? Like, for example, um, you know, Sherry Honkola as the 2012 uh, right. VP, was it always the case that uh, League of Revolutionary for New America uh, sort of members were intersecting the Green Party, or was that a more recent edition? What about um, the that, Green that, Party debates published by Haymarket? I think um, that was more of a new thing. Um, I was just at a um, 
Marshall's conference up in Northwestern Illinois. Oh, excuse me, yeah, Northwestern University. It was in, uh, ran by the ISO. And I said to me, I'm like, what is the future of the ISO? And it was amazing to hear the young ISO people there that voted green. Because I never, I never heard that statistic ever, that a lot of people in the ISO voted green. In fact, they were leaning towards more Green Party than the socialist candidate, Stuart Alexander, you know, who was on the ballot in some states. So, I mean, it's a recent thing because the Green Party is a little bit being more tolerant of being more open to having the Marxists and anarchists to come into play and have these conversations. Um, there has been some time that there was, you know, we're on the left, but these radicals, not so much. But some of us who are radicals, like, no, you need to have us because who else is going to do it for you? You know, so that's where we're trying to build these bridges, you know, talking to ISO, talking to um, Socialist Party USA, um, talking to situationists, talking to anarcho syndicalists, you know. We're, we're, we're having these conversations. It's just a matter of how to make them more effective in the strategies that we would like to do. Got a lot of questions. So, so Divya, Tom, and then Randy. So, um, I had a question about how you can, and I think this might have been covered before, but I think just to sort of clarify how you conceive of the relationship between unions and the party, or these various issues that we've been talking about, and the party, um, like what kind of leadership can the party <coughs> provide to these um, struggles against sort of more or like more immediate like struggles against immediately oppressive conditions if you want to put it like that um like does the party like what constitutes listening to these concerns to these issues um or to the unions um does that mean that party politics then becomes um the struggles of the unions or the various issues um, or does it constitute like putting putting these struggles against a more broadly defined like, horizon? Um, so yeah. Tom. Oh, right. <clears throat> so uh, I think uh, my question kind of relates to uh, Greg's about uh, the sort of particular interests of. Uh, um, workers uh, and worker cooperatives versus uh, environmental problems. However, I wanted to uh, go back to um, the example you raised of uh, Mondragon. Uh, yeah, is that how you say Mondragon. Um, so I was reading this uh, article recently, this um, uh, finding that I was saying that uh, Mondragon in the past uh, couple of years has gone multinational. Yeah. Um, and they were saying that the uh, the factories that they were opening up or the um, yeah, that they were opening up uh, in in various places throughout Asia were actually not uh, fully a part of not run on the same cooperative basis and actually provided a um, source of cheap labor, much like a um, normal, you know, uh, non-cooperative uh, multinational right. company that you think of. Um, and it said that this was arising out of the sort of pressures uh, to uh, stay afloat in a, in a world of global competitive market and continue to provide the high wages and uh, um, benefits that the cooperative allowed for. Um, in in the original uh, um, plants in uh, in Europe, and so my question is, uh, um, while the emphasis on this sort of uh, uh, grassroots formation of cooperatives um, um, and this sort of emphasis on uh, you know social movement from below, uh, sort of converging or coalescing is very popular right now. Um, is this uh, um, problem or this sort of 
contradiction between the particular interests of, um, you know, an isolated workers cooperative in a global capitalist economy, something that the Green Party is uh, attentive to or addresses um, in your uh, attempts to address programmatically or uh, in terms of consciousness. Yeah, this was actually what I wanted to speak to also. Um, I mean, I was at the very first Earth Day in April 22nd, 1970. I won't count how many years ago that was, but, um, you know, and it's been, you know, more than a decade in the food co-op movement, you know, where we sort of created the markets for larger companies, you know, to take over the organic farming, and even the bins, you know, that we built with our cheap labor and so on. You know, but then, you know, there was an example, uh, in the New Republic there was an article about these factories in Yugoslavia, you know, that were run by the workers, and they didn't put enough investment, even in the machines in the factory, let alone in larger environmental things, which are seen as external to profitability. You know, in other words, you know, they were back to this basic contradiction, you know, can you change production and social relations under capitalism without overthrowing it? No. You know what I mean? That's the basic thing. You know, it's not, as Greg was saying, a choice. It's not a choice to decrease or increase carbon emissions. It's a necessity. You know, in this Mondragon thing, Ray Lotta brought up that exact point at the Platypus panel on radical economics. That's an example. You cannot change those production relations in a capitalist market. Good point. <laughs> all right, that's a lot. <laughs> so don't forget to this question all the way back. I'm going to tie those two together. One of my um, things I do some research on is how does capitalist societies transform into socialistic societies? Why do countries like Sweden have the best health care in the world, education on a report card, if you will, is higher than anyone else, and they have good working conditions in Sweden. Um, and that's just Sweden, but in France as well. Um, why, how do these industrial, some of these industrial societies transition from a capitalist society to a socialist society and some of them work. Why is Cuba working? Why is Venezuela working? Um, why is China working to a degree? And I have a little bit of an answer to that one. So I think it's possible the United States can transform from a, social, from a capitalistic society to a socialist society and we've seen that moment and they'll do the New Deal. The WPA, the Worker of Progress Administration, was a good example of how socialism works. Now, it was government dollars that was in the WPA and then trickled down, if you will, into programs like the Federal Arts Project, the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Music Project, CCC, things like that. Those things worked. And because of that, it helped cities like Chicago get out of the red a little bit. They put people to work. Now, that was the government running that, but it was for that brief moment that it was socialism. Was it true socialism? No. But it was socialism. And there's records and there's um, research that does reinforce that fact, that, there, that for a moment, for a brief time in history, that the United States was in under a socialist model. Yes, an organization like a Dragon can be a multinational corporation doing the very thing it did grassroots and then evolve and then all of a sudden it's going to the exact it's going referring excuse me, defaulting back to what corporations are doing. Doing cheap labor, maybe cutting corners, things like that. That's that's what happens. <laughs> That's evolution. Now, how do we stop that? We stop that by, again, if we're looking at the Green Party, 10 key values, 
and the cooperative principles, how if I and if I had talked to the administration at Mondragon, it would be how are you being future focused with your company? How are you promoting ecological wisdom? How are you being the grassroots democratic organization that you once were? Those are the things I would be asking and having this serious conversation on how to tighten up those things. That we don't need cheap labor in order to be a cooperative, um, trying to tighten up the policies within that organization. So that would be some of the things if a, a Green Party person was in, um, in politics or if you had a cooperative worker do it, they'll be doing those, those very things, trying to pretty much put them in check. We're in the wrong. Here's why we're in the wrong. And if you're, in the, if you're a true cooperative, you would be part of this participatory environment. If, if, it, if they're really truly doing that. Um, but I do believe capitalist societies can transform our social societies. The research is there. Um, we've seen that happen. You know, Chavez does that. He did do that, excuse me. He did do that. You know, it worked for Venezuela. Cooperatives work in Venezuela. Um, in fact, they, they, I was part of a project with the Venezuelan consulate here to create cooperative sister cities. And when I lived in Milwaukee, it was pretty much an exchange program that people in Milwaukee go to Venezuela, and vice versa, to work in cooperatives to see how it feels and see how we can generate our own transition from a capital society to a social society in the United States. Going to the question about unions and the party, um, the listening aspect of it is really having open communication. Um, and we start that by contacting the union leaders, having an open conversation. I'm talking to Ask Me 31 down in Springfield saying, we're at the table. Where are you at? You know, you have not once talked to anyone in the Green Party, but some people in the unions have this preconceived notion of what the Green Party is about. But they've never once had a conversation with us. You know, they, they, they'll talk to us saying this is what we're doing, and we provide them information saying, you know, this is what we're about. We have our candidates go endorsement meetings, and that's the extent of it. You know, we're always at the table to have this conversation. You know, what can we do now? We just like get candidates elected, but what can we do to help you to advance your message? And that, it's not just a Green Party thing, this is universal. Stepping out of politics for, for a moment, I'm of the belief that in order to have effective activists, activism in the United States, then you really truly need to have open communication with your like-minded brothers and sisters. We can't have silos in the United States. What I mean by silos is we can't just say, this is my territory, back off. That needs to be broken. We need to have these conversations like, look, I'm doing this. How can I help you? And that's how I feel that's one aspect that the left and the Green Party can help bring the, bring the left together, is having these open dialogues. And that's the way with the unions, too. You know, we had these, had these open dialogues. That's so why I'm kind of hoping to wait for the Chicago Teachers Union to call the Green Party saying, we're here. What can you do for us? We have Green Party members involved in the teachers' union. They're a part of those meetings. You know, we have members part of the IEA, the Illinois Educators Association. We have people in that rank and file. You know, they know we're involved, but they have not once come to the table with us. We go to them for endorsement, but they have never once come to us. Of, of 
minimum wage labor society in this country. You know, this, this is what our politics is about. You know, this is what Romney is going to address. This is what Obama is going to address. Who's going to deliver jobs? Right. And of course, traditionally, environmentalist politics has lost a certain hearing or it doesn't gain a certain hearing to the extent that it seems to imply that you know, the problem is people consume too much. Uh, that, that, that consumption and the desires of, of workers to have a certain standard of living uh, is, is somehow um, you know, a, a problem or carbon footprint without really raising the issue of, of the nature of our collective relationship to nature and, and its reproducibility. So how does green politics address, not just in a sense organized labor, because the real issue politically with relation to organized labor is how do you politically mediate the connection between people who have jobs and those who do not, right? Where, in a sense, a trade union on its own, in, in its, in, from the outside, looks like a way to exclude everybody else. Uh, and, and it really was a question of, of political mediation. How do organized workers take up the demands of, of the unemployed? And of course, we have a, a vast amount, a growing number of unemployed people and, 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 and semi-employed people in this country. Um, and I wonder how you know, the Green Party can, can really address that kind of endemic question uh, and I think it, it raises issues of immigration policy, it raises issues of internationalism uh, in, in, in ways that um, you know, perhaps a kind of policy focus gets, the national or you know, much less local policy focus gets, um, you know, constraints an issue. And uh, let me ask Ed to go ahead and stack on top Actually, of that. that. That kind of supersedes my question. Yeah, so maybe that would be fine just to answer that. Going back to what we said earlier about a WPA style approach, um, it would be essentially that. We don't have a significant amount of green jobs in the United States. Okay? Well, people need to be employed. So I don't see a reason why we couldn't have a green WPA style policy where money can be put into something whether reverting back to the CCC, the Civilian Conversation Corps, where you're, you're employing people to go and, you know, spread seeds of prairie in Illinois, trees and parks and everything. Colorado's having an issue with trees because they're, the state didn't take care of their environment and everything, so they could have had people employed there to take care of things right there. Or employing people just doing factory jobs of solar power plants, wind turbine plants, or doing something. It could be easy as cleaning the streets here in Chicago. That's a green job too, you know? I mean, if you want to just employ people just doing that, that kind of somewhat sanitation work, it's something. Um, even go as far as saying, you know, we need to have people do something. So having that kind of green WPA style policy that we have this huge amount of unemployment and then how can we use that for the kind of green revolution we want? That be it from clean the street, clean neighborhoods to working in a factory or possibly building factories. Because we have some labor people who are out of work and if we need to have more solar power plants, if that's a direction we need to have for alternative energy, then have them do that. You know, um, I can't speak to like the immigration um, policy to that. But this would exist side by side, side, side by side, with capitalist corporations. And so, I mean, what would what would keep capitalist corporations just from hijacking state policy and getting getting the tax base to pay for their labor? Well, I mean, we've been talking about the tax credits, stuff like that. I mean, again, it goes back to putting pressure on federal and state government. You know, I remember um, a plant near my hometown, um, they, their number one factory, stellar performance, low um, sick days and everything, 
was their number one shop. They were closing it because they didn't get a tax credit because they were moving to North Carolina. Why did they even do that? You know, so some of us even fought our state representative on that. It's like, why are you even allowing this? And he was a Republican. <clears throat> you know, so it's things like that we have to put pressure on with, like when it comes to tax credit, um, regulation, um, tariffs, things like that. We need to put pressure on them. You know, even though we don't have the political muscle yet to be in office and sign legislation or work with other elected officials, we can still do the activism political muscle by putting pressure on elected officials, by putting pressure on corporations saying, you're in the wrong, here's why, here's our solution, please listen to us. If not, we're demanding you to listen to us because we have solutions that you're not even listening to. Lenny and Ben, was there a question in the back? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Greg, you can step on top of this too immediately. Is there any other questions? This is the last round of questions. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, well, why don't we just hear from those who haven't asked questions, if that's all right. Uh, ben, and in the back, and Stephanie here. And, and let it just be that. So I wanted to ask, I mean, I think that from the standpoint of, you know, the revolutionary left, if you will, um, the whole kind of history around the WPA um, has this kind of narrative in which the kind of response of the Roosevelt administration was to the kind of unpredictable, kind of tumultuous character of um, kind of massive unemployment section of the labor force, and in a sense that, you know, the argument would be made that that was really actually a kind of conservative move in order to prevent radicalization from spreading within right. the, you know, spreading from the discontents of this kind of um, unemployed labor force. <clears throat> so I, my question is kind of in two parts. One is, you know, by contrast to that, um, how do you see this as a kind of progressive um, kind of advance on the part of that administration at the time, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this kind of perspective of, of a more revolutionary left politics, but also, um, does the situation have to get so bad? You talk about like pressure. Um, you know, it seems that even if one discounts the kind of notion that you know the American uh, working class would have, you know, been more susceptible to revolutionary politics had this program not been stated, but nevertheless, the pressure wasn't just from like, you know. Um, Particular lobbyists, but from the fact that you know society was kind of encountering a major problem in the form of you know, large sections of the working class being out of work. So does the pressure have to come in the form of like a kind of collapse of the American economy on the scale of the Great Depression in order for even these types of programs to gain any kind of hearing within uh, you know federal officials? And is it progressive if they the federal officials were to capitalize on that situation to kind of state you know? hold at bay the more radicalization of the, of the working class. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> my question has to do with the public perception. Uh, today, <clears throat> environmental uh, disinformation disseminated through numerous channels uh, that depict environmentalists as unrepresented to the nuts who needlessly threaten economic prosperity and personal freedoms. So, what can be done to counteract these assertions in order to bring about a uh, large-scale attitudinal shift? Well, I was kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier <coughs> with uh, the uh, WPA idea. And um, not only what you were, Spencer, what you were saying with co competition with industry, you know, private industry, but private industry is already embedded in government. And, and so I, I learned sort of up close and personal by working for SEIU, how, how, you know, um, like that's a whole other story. And it's kind of like unions as the handmaiden of, of, of capital. But um, anyway, so, and you know, then there's a lot of no bid contracting and a lot of, so it's kind of like they're already in there, kind of, 
making sure that stuff will just go where they want it to go. Um, I mean, it just seems like a kind of a monumental, I don't know. I mean, what, what, what you're talking about, just, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, I, um, Private capital's I, interest flowing through the state. Right, right, right. I, I mean, I just wondered if, if there was if there was any thinking about that in terms of, you know, you say pressure on officials, and, and yet these officials themselves are kind of. Okay. Um, so I'll jump on that one. Um, that's the one where we say, you know, this is the person behind the curtain. That's what that's 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 also our job, you know, trying to tell, tell the general public. I'm like, the very person that you're talking to, I'm gonna pick our, our fine mayor here for a second. <laughs> um, you know, he's a contract employee of Goldman Sachs. And some people don't know that, you know. He's a mayor who was a representative in the 5th Congressional District, chief of staff of Obama, part of the DCCC and everything. He's a political operative, but people don't know that he is also a contract employee to Goldman Sachs to this day. And a lot of people don't even know that. And Goldman Sachs got a bailout, which means he got a bailout. Our, our own mayor got a bailout. So those are the things that we also do, is trying to say, you know, you elect these people in the office, but they're embedded with company X, Y, and Z, with lobbyist A, B, C, you know? We always try to draw these visualizations. I'm like, this is what's going on here, but how can you still vote for them while they're hurting us as a society? So we try to, that's why we don't take corporate money, lobby money, and to some degree, union money, is because we don't have those kinds of ties. All of our money goes, all of our money comes from people, all of our money comes from um, organizations that believe in what we do is right. Um, so in terms of public interest and fighting that and pressure, um, we just pull the curtain and saying, this is the person that's running the show. And look at all of these things that's happened in this web of embedment. Um, the person in the back, you're talking about the environment. If I'm hearing the question correctly, you're asking why the environmentalists are not being heard. Exactly. Um, because, you know, if you go back to what government officials did in the 60s and 70s with the environmentalists, they thought they were crazy. <laughs> Tree huggers. You know, they're just these hippies that just go around and they care about the environment. And why? You still have that same mentality, but it's a different wording. But that's why um, the environmentalists are part of the Green Party and the Green Party movement. Um, I don't know if you heard earlier when I said this, but like in the 70s, you know, environmentalists got together to form the Green Party in Germany and everything. So we still have environmentalists to this day that are involved with the Green Party. Um, Dr. Ivana Shiva, she's a big supporter of the Green Party. She's openly has said that she supports the Green Party and has voted in Green Party politics before. Um, she's a big, she was a huge supporter of Ralph Bader in 2000. So that's one of her biggest advocates is that, you know, but she fights for Earth justice, right? So they're not, so why the environment's not being heard is because, again, the media and other um, entities are barring them from that. So the environmentalists come to organizations like the Green Party to have that megaphone. Excel um, demonstration that we had in DC, the environments were heard because we, when I say we, a fair amount of our state parties went to DC and saying, enough's enough, no XL pipeline. So environments aren't being heard because they have barriers being put up and yet they will come to us, which is awesome, to use us as that platform in order to be heard, and they're still being heard um, to this day. Um, and going to your question, 
And if I want, I'm gonna make this correct. So if I'm hearing you right, you know, how can you create a revolutionary WPA style type of program or policy? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Well, more, more to the like effect that from a revolutionary perspective, the WPA was a kind of conservative turn. Yes. And that you were characterizing it as a kind of progressive turn. So I'm just kind of wondering about the tension between those two narratives. You know, it just goes back to, well, it's, again, it's what lens are you looking at through? You know, my lens has always been the WPA was a progressive um, a policy because of what it did. It gave people jobs and it also became innovative on the art side. I looked at the WPA more on the art side. You know, it got put artists to work. Um, Thomas Hart Benton came out of the WPA. So without Thomas Hart Benton, we wouldn't have Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock was part of the WPA at the time. Um, Robert De Niro's father was part of the Federal Theater Project, which Robert De Niro is the, I feel the greatest actor of all time because his father, because of what he did and everything. Um, we wouldn't have the Goodman Theater here in Chicago because that was a WPA project. It was built and there was actors in there and everything. So it was progressive because it provided jobs and it was also innovative of what it did. The CCC is another example. Um, they put people out in fields and state parks. You know, trees were being decimated, so they put trees, they put seedlings out there, and now we go to parks like in Northern Illinois. They just grow to this day and everything. Um, so I really can't answer that only because, again, I'm, I'm being a little bit biased because I do think it was a progressive policy, but as a Green Party, we're trying to take a step forward and saying we want a green <coughs> New Deal policy by providing green jobs, green policy, and we need that here and now. And remind me about your second question, I have pressure and collapse. Oh, does it take a, again, it goes back to that reactionary mentality, you know. It goes back to, does it really have to take a collapse financially in order to wake up? Um, no. Some people just need to wake up and realize at what point do you have to realize that you need to change the way of your thinking when it comes to electing officials, you're thinking of how to get ourselves out of the situation financially. And it takes a lot of effort to do that. It doesn't happen overnight. But people need to be aware, and we need, all of us in this room, need to <coughs> keep educating people on why things like the Green Party works, Socialist Party works, Communist Party works, Justice Party works, cooperative movement why it works. We need to keep doing that in order to not be on the brink of collapse financially here in the United States. Everyone, please join me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick announcement. The Party for Socialism and Liberation, their workshop will take place here uh, starting at 3.40. And then we'll have uh, Quebec Solidaire in that room and exit upstairs. All right.